All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Tamburi. I'm the current treasurer and 2019-2020 president-elect of the Nittany Divers Scuba Club. but apparently we're all doing great. But I'm going to ask anyone, how's everyone doing tonight? Great! Oh my goodness. All right, so I have to like act like I coach soccer for a living. We need to take that enthusiasm that's somewhere down there, throw it through the roof. How are we doing tonight? Yeah! I'll let you all know, my eight-year-old kids do a little bit better than that, but that's okay. Uh, so, for those of you that are not Penn State students but are at Penn State tonight and have been here before, welcome back. For those of you that have never been to Penn State, why? Uh, <laughs> my question of the night, but uh, if that is the case, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you all here tonight, and I want to thank you all for spending your Thursday evening with us. Uh, so like you said, I'm involved in Nittany Divers. For those of you that don't know about our organization, uh, we're one of more than 1,200 student organizations at Penn State. Uh, we hold meetings every two weeks. We travel to really cool conventions. We actually have 11 of our members going to Beneath the Sea this weekend in New Jersey. And we hold events like this. Uh, in events like this, we hope to outreach to more than just scuba divers, but to snorkelers, swimmers, anyone who really cares about our planet um, and enjoys the ocean, everything the ocean holds. Um, quick shout out to Marine Science Society for being here tonight. They're another one of the recognized student orgs. They really helped to put this event on and to make sure everything went smoothly and to keep me sane all at the same time. So I did have a thought walking into the room uh, this evening, and that thought was, Autumn has never been to Penn State. She's never been to Happy Valley. She doesn't know what we do here. So I thought the only appropriate way to welcome her to our stage is to give her a big Penn State welcome in the way that hopefully everyone in the front row knows, and hopefully all of you know as well. So if you know the words, chant along. If you don't know the words, well, that's going to change really, really quickly. <laughs> So, without further ado, we are Penn State! We are Penn State! We are Penn State! Thank you! You're welcome! And without further ado, I now present the founder and CEO of Stream to Sea, Otto Blum. Thank you. I think I need to hire her. She's amazing, right? <laughs> Well, thanks everybody. Is this a little too loud? It feels loud in my ear. No, we're good? All right, excellent. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight and, of course, for Nittany Divers Club for in inviting me. Um, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure. Um, tonight we're going to talk about sunscreen and contaminants. Before we do, I'd like to just get to know you a little bit. Who's in this room are divers? Right on. All right, I'm among friends. This is good. Who's not a diver? We've got some work to do. Okay. We're, we're not giving any dive training tonight, but that can be discussed afterwards. I have some friends in the room that can help with that. All right, but what we're really going to talk about is sunscreen and contaminants. There's a lot of um, media and publicity going out right now, which means it's becoming popular, which means it's becoming trendy, and it also means that um, there's a lot of marketing deception going on. So, obviously, educated room. Hopefully, by the end of the night, you'll be even a little bit more educated and know how to tell if the product that you're using is actually safe or if it's just kind of trendy, okay? Everybody received the sample before they walk in the room? Does everybody have a little card, a little ingredient to avoid card? That's important. Awesome, okay. You'll need it later, you don't need it right now. So introductions, um, I'm Autumn, thank you, Christine. Um, I am a cosmetic chemist. I've been formulating natural products and organic skincare for about 20 years now. Um, I'm also an ocean advocate. I'm a technical diver. I've been diving since I was 14 years old. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had several businesses. I have a small group called Scuba Girls. We run some dive travel, do some training down in the Keys. But really, the day job is stream to sea. Um, I started a company a year out of undergrad, uh, making organic and natural skincare products. I sold it in 2009 and was working for the company that I sold it for went on vacation, which is foreign if you're an entrepreneur. Anybody that's a small business owner knows you don't really go on vacation. But as an employee, I got to do that, and I'm diving in Palau. Um, this was what, five years ago now um, with John, who is the photographer of all the images you were just watching coming in. We'll talk about those a little bit when we're done if I don't drag on too long. 
So we're diving in Palau, and it is the most beautiful, pristine, healthy reef that I'd ever seen. It was spectacular. Um, I'm coming up towards my safety stop, and then I saw a rainbow sheen. I'm like, oh, look, how beautiful. As I got closer and closer, I realized that was not a rainbow. It was an oil slick, and it was coming off of a group of snorkelers on the surface. Now, mind you, I've been formulating organic skincare for, at that point, 15 years. And I get back on the boat, and I grab the nearest bottle that I could find, and it said that it was a reef-safe product. And I flip it over, and I see all the O ingredients, um, oxybenzone, octanoxate, um, octocrylene was in there, parabens were in there, all sorts of petroleum-based products, and it was being sold as something that was healthy and good for us and for the waters. I was appalled. Um, I then looked over, and I saw um, a bunch of divers were showering off the back of the deck. And the foamy suds are running overboard. And I'm looking down, my heart kind of sank a little bit. Um, I'd been in this world for 15 years, and I never really thought about how these products affected our world and our waters. I knew how they affected us, just never really went that step further. Um, before I left that trip, I knew what I was going to spend the rest of my career doing. And that is this. So I left the day job, started formulating Stream to Sea, spent the next year um, testing, failing, and then ultimately succeeding. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But our oceans need as much protection as they can possibly get. This is taken in Key Largo. This is a beautiful pillar coral. There's a blight that's traveling along the uh, southeast coast, killing off the pillar coral. Right now, that picture on the right was taken five months later. It's rubble now. It breaks my heart. And as everybody in here knows, there's so many things impacting our oceans. I mean, you've got climate change, overpopulation, ocean acidification. Sometimes you just sit there and say, well, what can I do? I mean, there's, it's, it's a little intimidating, right? There are certain things that we can do that cumulatively do add up. Why wouldn't we? I mean, single-use plastics bring your own cutlery, right? I mean, there's obviously the straws. That's what's popular right now. But anything that we can do is a step in the right direction. And sunscreen is definitely one of them. And it's really exciting that the governments are starting to agree with us. Um, Palau, Hawaii, Bonaire, Aruba, Key West. That one's really exciting. Um, the Florida Keys, hopefully, and the whole state. Uh, I don't know about that one, but the Keys should be next. Um, Palau went a step further. So there, there's blessings and curses along with what Hawaii's done. Hawaii came along and looked at some of the studies, oxybenzone and octanoxate, octinoxate, however you want to pronounce it, potato, potato, I say octanoxate, have been proven toxic. So com companies out there are taking these two ingredients out of their formulas, replacing them with avobenzone and octocrylene, and slapping a reef-safe label on the front of it. Well, oxybenzone, avobenzone. Any chemistry students in the room? Study organic chemistry? Yeah, oxybenzone, avobenzone really close. They're really similar, right? It's pretty offensive. So Palau went a step further, and they banned all 13 ingredients that are on the Hereticus Environmental Lab. This is a group that is publishing the studies and really keeping this at the front of the awareness. Um, there's over 200 published studies talking about oxybenzone toxicity for both humans and the reefs, but this is the one that's really getting the most media attention today, right? So they banned all 13 of those ingredients. And I say, be like Palau, know your ingredients. Don't just, just because two ingredients are shown toxic doesn't mean that the rest of them are safe, right? This isn't innocent until proven guilty. Um, NOAA, so how much is actually out there? NOAA estimates that up to 14,000 tons enter our coastal reefs every year. That's just ours. And that's from tourism. I actually think that's a little conservative. It's a huge number. But when you think about it, all the thousands and thousands of tourists that are out there that are being told, apply an ounce of sunscreen to your body every 90 minutes, right? And then jump in the ocean, it washes right off. I think it's conservative. And it doesn't take into account the sewage. So I have a lot of people, we're not on the coast here, that will say, you know, I only, I only use safe products when I'm in the ocean. That's awesome. That's a great start. But where does it go when you use it anywhere? I mean, streams all flow to the sea, right? Wastewater treatment facilities cannot filter out these ingredients. They're um, soluble, and they go right through. If you put a sunscreen containing oxybenzone on your skin, it absorbs into your body. Within 30 minutes, it can be detected in your urine. It goes right down the drain, right? So do these really impact our health and waters? Studies after studies are showing that yes, yes, in fact, they do. Oxybenzone, octanoxate, parabens, clear and nano zinc. That one gets a little confusing. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, these all have been shown to be very harmful 
to not just us, but to the aquatic environment. 62 parts per trillion is the, is the smallest amount that was shown. That's a really hard number to envision. So they say it's equivalent to one drop in six Olympic-sized swimming pools. So it does not take much, and that's enough to deform the larva to where it cannot reproduce, which means the reefs aren't able to recolonize themselves, and that's what we're seeing out there. These ingredients also bioaccumulate, by the way. So if, an, if a creature or a human is exposed to them, you might be exposed to this much, and then later on you're exposed to this much. It doesn't, it all adds up, right? Um, so what does this do to us and various mammals out there? Well, it's toxic to the sperm and the sperm development. How many people are allergic to sunscreen? You know, you say you can't wear it, right? More often than not, it's not sunscreen, it's oxybenzone. It was um, listed as the allergen of the year in 2014 by the American Dermatological Association. And the same groups are saying that it's really good and apply lots. They're starting to not do that anymore. Um, testosterone blocker increases feminization, basically endocrine disruptors. They mess with our hormones. Uh, again, detected in the urine 30 minutes after exposure. It's also found in semen, placenta, and breast milk. It goes throughout our bodies, right? So you put it on. Sunscreens are regulated as drugs, right? Because they work inside of our bodies. So you put it on, it, it goes throughout you. Um, 2008, the CDC did a study and found that more than 96% of Americans had oxybenzone in their bloodstream. That wasn't sampled at Miami Beach. That was in Atlanta, Georgia. They also found it was 85.6% uh, of babies were born with oxybenzone in their bodies. Octinacate is the other one that has become trendy. So a lot of companies in 2005, oxybenzone was shown toxic, so companies took oxybenzone out replaced it with octinacate, which is also known as octomethoxycinamate. And it basically has, the, has very similar properties. Endocrine disruptor adversely affects specifically targeting the estrogen, the androgen, progesterone, and the thyroid hormone um, receptors. It increases feminization. So sometimes we like to giggle in our offices that uh, we're getting a lot more feminine boys these days. Not that there's anything really wrong with that, but it's we believe that there's some very direct causes to increased estrogen during their developmental cycle because of the because of the endocrine disrupting chemicals that their mothers are exposed to before they're born, and there are studies linking that. Again, we all know now you put it on your body; it's absorbed into your skin. It is most important. Obviously, I think that um, avoiding these chemicals is important for anybody, but especially if you're trying to conceive, planning to conceive, or have, have a, a child. Anybody in the developmental cycle is very sensitive to these ingredients. Uh, there was actually a paper study, a paper studied, a paper published this week that directly linked uh, oxybenzone to Hirschsprung's disease, which is a digestive disorder in babies. So a, a popular uh, old endocrinologist um, was reported to say the way estrogen works in a fish and an alligator and a frog and a bird and a mouse and a woman is basically the same. So why are these ingredients toxic? Because they're endocrine disruptors. Just because oxybenzone and octinoxate are proven toxic doesn't mean that the other endocrine disruptors, which they are known to be endocrine disruptors, aren't. Because it's all the same method of action, right? So does the endocrine disruption make any difference? Well, they did a study with zebrafish, common laboratory study, and exposed them to a little bit, and the males turned female, and the females turned male. There's a fish named Pat in Hawaii. It's a parrotfish that some of the local local uh, surfers have named. And he, you know, fish will transform, right? Well, he's like like their poster transgender fish. He's stuck. He's not male. He's not female. He's right in that transition stage, and he's been there for more than a year. They all know him. And of course, it's a very popular tourist area. So there's lots of sunscreen in the waters there. So on the reefs, that little image right there is a healthy coral fragment on the left. The one on the right was exposed to a common sunscreen ingredient. For 96 hours, was completely bleached. Um, leads to, once a coral is bleached, it's not dead, but it's more susceptible to death, right? It's, it's not healthy. Uh, these ingredients also, when they're exposed to very small concentrations, they are more susceptible to climate change. So if they would typically bleach at, say, 86 degrees, it can knock it down to 82 or 84 degrees. And octanoxate basically has the very similar effects, again, because it's an endocrine-disrupting chemical. The one on the left, healthy normal fragment, 
The one on the right was exposed to one part per billion and was completely bleached. So how much oxybenzone is actually out there? The uh, researchers went out in 2015 and sampled various sites around Hawaii and found over on the left, Nama Bay, 4,252 parts per trillion. Again, remember, 62 parts per trillion is how much was shown to be toxic. Right? Um, up in the tip over there, Hana, they didn't have any. That's awesome. You can't swim there. You'd die. Uh, <laughs> Honolulu Bay, 1,900 parts per trillion. So it is definitely in the waters in very serious concentrations. Um, I was told that this is Steven Tyler's house up there. You guys know who Steven Tyler is? Okay, showing my age there. Um, he was he was saying that uh, it was a beautiful, healthy reef. He used to like to snorkel there, and now it's all gone. What's going on? The researchers came over, they tested the waters, and they found 5,400 parts per trillion of octanoxate there. But that was after, in 2015, it was 1,500. And again, they took the oxybenzone out, they're replacing it with these other chemicals, and you can clearly see it with the sampling time. And again, 105 parts per trillion is how much is shown to be toxic. Uh, Virgin Islands, Trunk Bay, this is a very popular beach destination. This is not parts per trillion, this is parts per billion. 1,395. There's not a whole lot to see if you go snorkeling there. Florida, same thing, my home. Um, 4,474 parts per trillion. The interesting one there is the camper. There's not a whole lot, but that's illegal. It's been not permitted for sale or use in the U.S. for quite some time. Same thing with Pabas, and we're still finding them. So long-term effects, right? Things out in the sand. This is an interesting picture. This was sent to me by a coral scientist, Bill Pretch. Um, he used to work for NOAA, I believe. I think he still does. He took a group of coral students, um, scientists out snorkeling, and he uses our sunscreen. He was sharing it with the kids, and one of them said that she couldn't use it. She had to use her own. She put it on. It had all the nasty chemicals in there. They go out snorkeling, they're surveying the coral. It's a little bit surgy. And she wound up hand planting that beautiful brain coral just to keep from crashing into it. And a week later they came out and you can really clearly see that hand plant there. Pretty wild. This one's a little bit hard to look at. This is a dotty back larva um, to talk about the developmental cycle, how important it is. On the left is a normal healthy larva. In the middle was one exposed to some sunscreen. Its internal organs has exploded. The one on the right had an aneurysm. Kind of gross. That was 24 hours, by the way. This is a friend who went to a park and saw a guy standing there with that aerosol sunscreen spraying his feet. Came back a day later and the grass was all dead. So those, speaking of those aerosol sunscreens, right, you're spraying it all over. How much do you think actually hits the target? Right, you're putting it on, it gets all over the boat, it gets everywhere else, it goes down. 450 meters is how far they've shown it to be able to carry. And again, these ingredients suck into the sand. So silica acts as an absorber for them. They accumulate, they bioaccumulate, they hang out in there. And what happens in the sand? Well, sweet little birds go and nest in it. We're finding these ingredients in the birds and the bird eggs. And our sweet little turtles. In the shells. And in the fish that we are consuming. So everybody hears about mercury contamination levels in sushi. Well, we've got sunscreen in there too now. So how do we be a conscious consumer? You've got that ingredients avoid card, right? On the back of it, it's really easy. You don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be a chemist. And of course, I'd love you to use my stuff, but there's good products out there. It's being a conscious consumer. So you pick a product up off your shelf, go into your bathroom tonight, pick it up, flip it over, look at those ingredients, especially the, uh, the beginning ones, the active ingredients. If you're talking about a sunscreen. Just take a quick peek. The, are, they, are they on the right? Do you have anything that says camphor? Is it a benzophenone? Clear and nano zinc. I want to talk about that one for just a second. That's, uh, that's kind of a little controversial in the safe sunscreen world. Um, we all know to look for non-nano. Has everybody heard that terminology? If you want to use a mineral sunscreen, um, zinc and titanium, you want to look for the words non-nano. Nano ties, basically the way that you can make a sunscreen not pasty is by adding oil to it so it spreads really easy. Makes you really greasy, makes your mask slip. I don't like it that way, but it's safe. It's good for you. Or you can nanotize, you can make the particles small. Well, clear zinc, what they're doing is they're making the particles really small, and then they're smooshing them together. If you look at it under a scanning electron microscope, you see all these little particles smooshed together. If you look at the material safety data sheets of these products, of these ingredients, they all say that they're aquatic toxic, yet they're showing up in lots of our products that are saying that they're reef safe. So that's one that's not real trendy, or it's a little controversial for me to talk about, but I talk about it because knowledge is power, right? So it's easy to do. Just look, read your ingredients is the 
is the gist on that one. So chemical sunscreens versus mineral sunscreens. I'm a chemist. I didn't like the terminology. I fight against it. I say we're all chemicals, right? I mean, everything we breathe, it's all chemistry. It's all chemicals. But the way in the world, everybody talks about chemical versus mineral. What they're really talking about is UV-absorbing chemicals or UV-reflecting minerals, right? So the UV-absorbing chemicals is what we're all used to. It's what we grew up using. It's, uh, you know, like goes on like jargons, like our body lotion, smear it all over. It's inexpensive. It's, it goes on easy. It smells nice. And it works. You're not going to get sunburn if you use it. You have to apply it 15 to 30 minutes prior to exposure. The reason for that is for those ingredients to soak into the fatty layers of your body, where you can then absorb the UV radiation, and your body filters it out. That's why they're regulated as drugs, right? They work inside our bodies. The mineral sunscreens, go on to the next one, zinc and titanium, the way that they work is, as long as it's non-nano, it works by creating a reflective barrier, so you should see it. It sits on top of your skin, it reflects the UV radiation away from your body. Then you wash it off when you're done. I like that concept a whole lot better, reflecting as opposed to absorbing. If you're trying to protect your body from the sun, why are you absorbing the radiation into your body? Makes no sense. I don't get it. The mineral sunscreens are also much more stable. Um, the common UV filters, as soon as they're exposed to UV light, they start to break down. The minerals really don't, right? They're much more stable. Some dispersions are clear, but again, you now know if it's clear zinc, chances are really good that it's not going to be safe for the aquatic environment. So mineral sunscreens need to be applied differently. We're all taught apply copiously, apply often, smear it on. You know, you, you squirt that bottle, I'll go make that sound, right? Right? Smear it out, rub it on, rub it all over. I've got too much here, honey, I'm going to put some on you. That's what we've all done. But with the mineral sunscreens, you have to apply in sections. You take a little bit pea size, large pea size amount. Place it in the palm of your hand, smush it together, pat it on, then blend. Do the same thing for your other arm. Blend it in, same thing for your face. Takes a little bit more effort. But once you put it on, you shouldn't be greasy, you shouldn't be Casper the Friendly Ghost White. You should see it, right? It's not gonna burn your eyes because that those other ingredients that are the allergens burn the snot out of your eyes. You know, you're underwater divers, right? You all know this. You're underwater and you can't rub your eyes but you're getting the sunscreen in there. That will not happen with a well-formulated mineral sunscreen. Lots of advantages there. But you do need to apply it differently. Now let's talk about SPF factor. I was asked if we have an SPF 462. No, we do not. We have an SPF 20 and an SPF 30. So everybody is told, I mean, it's the American way, right? More is more. If, I, if I'm protecting myself from the sun, let's use an SPF 1,000. I will look you in the eye and say, even if you are... Canadian and haven't been out in the sun for 16 years, an SPF 30, as long as you apply it properly, you're not going to get sunburn, right? So SPF is a factor, it's a protection level of time, not strength. So if you can spend 10 minutes in the sun without burning and you use an SPF 30, theoretically you can spend 300 minutes in the sun without burning. But you have to reapply every 80 minutes. So what's the difference, right? So the actual level of UVB, there's UVA rays, UVB rays, then we say the UVC rays. The A rays are the ones aging, that's why I say, you know, wrinkles. It's UVA aging, UVB is the burning rays. So for the UVB burning rays, an SPF 20 will block about 95% of those UVB rays. That's enough for most of us, if you've got any sort of pigmentation. Um, if you're really pale Irish, um, an SPF 30 is going to block a little more than 97% of those UVB rays. An SPF 50 is going to block less than 1% more. So the increase between that 30 and that 50 is less than 1%. It's very, very difficult to get there without either being pasty. I could make something like that, but you don't want to use it. I don't want to use it. Or you have to use the chemical ingredients. I just don't think it's worth it. Is that clear with everybody? You guys understand that? That's one of the biggest confusions out there when it comes to sunscreen. Personally, I, I think it goes back to marketing deception. You can charge more money for an SPF 50 than you can a 30. But really, cover up and reapply. You'll be doing great. So some of the testing, what we did a little bit differently, again, I've been making natural products for 20 years now. And when I made my first formula for Stream to Sea, it was a shampoo. Um, shampoos are notoriously different, difficult to make in the natural products industry to be performance-based. Usually they have no lather, you know, they, they leave your hair feeling like straw. If it's going to be a clean natural product, it's difficult to formulate. So that's one that I tackled first, and I was so stinking proud of this formula. I mean. It was, it was beautiful, and it was clean, it passed Whole Foods premium standards, it was eco-cert compliant, 
And I sent it off for aquatic toxicity testing, and I killed every fish in the tank. And I cried like a little girl, and I started over. Um, very different formulation strategy. Fish are different from us. Just because something's safe for us doesn't mean it's going to be safe for our fishy friends. Doesn't mean it's going to be safe for the reefs. And as far as I'm aware, we're the only company that's actually doing this testing, and they take a lot of heat for it. Oh my God, you're killing fish. I cried, I don't want to kill fish. But I also didn't want to be ignorant. And now I'm not, so we don't have to kill fish anymore, because we know. But, so we did some testing, and starting with the sunscreen, this one was really interesting. I compared it to another product, I compared ours, beautiful mineral-based, EcoCert compliant, titanium dioxide, non-nano, white sunscreen, and I compared it to one that said that it was bait safe, but it had oxybenzone, octanoxate, and parabens in it. This is some nasty stuff. This, how, how can this possibly be bait safe? It's going to kill fish like crazy, right? So I sent it off, and a researcher called back and says, hey, guess what? Your sunscreen didn't kill any fish, but the competitors only killed 30%, which in the eyes of the EPA means that it's safe, right? It's all about mortality. I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. I guess that's a good thing. He says, yeah, but wait a minute. We started looking at them, and guess what you're going to see? So swimming behavior. She started looking at what, what they were actually doing, their developmental cycle, their behavior cycle, and swimming, she says they weren't, she took some videos of it for me, they weren't floating upside down dead, but these fish were swimming upside down. They were doing handstands. They were bumping into the side of the tank. And of course, the little hippie girl in me, I'm like, get them out, get them out, get them out. But uh, so they, they were not happy fish. And of course, ours, they were swimming around. They were normal. You know, it was cloudy water, and it was, they were normal. And then the feeding behavior, same exact thing. Within 24 hours, our fish are feeding fine. The competitor's fish had absolutely no interest in, in the food there. So they were pretty messed up, and that was a a safe formula. In the eyes of EPA, that is a safe formula. Coral larva testing, same thing. We, we did the, we went out to um, Tropical Research Station, Summerlin, with, uh, it was Eckerd College, who, my alma mater, that's where I went to college. Um, they, they went out and collected coral larva, and we did some settlement studies. So the larva, in order for it to reproduce, it needs to settle on the substrate. And what we found is that ours did not significantly affect the settlement of the larva, with lots of sunscreen in there. And, of course, the competitor most definitely did. Those coral were not going to reproduce. And if they did, we probably wouldn't want them to because they would encase themselves in their own skeleton, and it'd be ugly. That's what happens when they're exposed to oxybenzone, by the way. One of the things. So, of course, we have two different sunscreens, and I want you guys to try it because, again, we talked about the application, right? This, every, you guys have a mix, right? Some have the white, some have the tinted. And I just want to show you real quick, if you don't mind, open yours up just so you know how to apply a mineral sunscreen. And I really do like the tinted. Um, I thought that when we launched it that we would no longer sell the original, but we actually sell the original three to one. It's pretty interesting. People like to know when to reapply. So if you put it on, you're going out on a boat, you can put it on, go do a couple dives, you come up, and usually you'll find that your mask will have rubbed off a little bit right here. Reapply some, you're good to go, or just reapply. So you just take like a pea-sized amount, rub it on. People like to do this, right? They like to just go like that. Don't do that, just get it. Rub it. But I want you to play with it, feel it. It should... Be should be non-greasy. And that's how you apply it, though. I mean, just a little bit in a section, and then do the next section. And do that with my mineral sunscreen, do it with any others. That's the way that you'll be happy using them. And the best sunscreen, of course, is one that you're actually going to use, because we don't want you getting burnt or cancer either. And as I mentioned, the first product that I formulated was a shampoo, and we failed. So it's wonderful that people are talking about sunscreen. I love it. But it's everything that we use at our home. You know, it's our laundry soap, it's our shampoo, it's our conditioner. These things all run to the sea. Be a conscious consumer. Pay attention. Look at it. It's easy. Once you train yourself with different ingredients to look at, you know, you're starting to read the ingredients in your food. If you can't totally pronounce them, look it up. Just because you can't pronounce it doesn't mean that it's bad, right? But it means that you should look at it twice. That's shameless plug. All of our tubes are made from sugarcane resins. Uh, so I didn't want to put it in petroleum-based plastic. I figured that'd be hypocritical. Rash guard. So some of the things that you can do, um, sunscreen, I make sunscreen, but I don't think you should be out laying out in the sun. I don't think you need to put it all over your body, right? If you're hanging out, you're going paddle boarding, snorkeling, whatever, cover up. You know, use a UPF shirt, wear a hat, hang out in the shade, and then apply sunscreen to your exposed skin. It is important to use. One of the arguments that the chemical lobbyists are using against us out there is, well, we don't want our people to get skin cancer. We don't want them saying, well, sunscreen's bad, so I just won't use it. No, we just want you to make conscious choices, right? 
do protect yourself. Do protect your skin. Isn't that a cute little dog? Isn't that adorable? I love that little guy. So some of the really easy things that you can do to help preserve our waters um, every day in our day-to-day -day life, we can make a difference just being a conscious consumer. We can't wait for our government to do it, whether the government bans these ingredients or not. If you're a conscious consumer, teach people. Tell them about it. When they come into your dive center and they're going snorkeling or diving, they're going on a trip, hey, what sunscreen are you bringing with you? What the conditioner that you're using? Read the ingredients. Make sure it's safe. Right? We have big mouths. We can help educate. Take three for the sea. That's one of my favorite initiatives. It's on Instagram, and they, they're all over the place. Every time you go outside, pick up three pieces of garbage. It's a fun little game. You can tag. It's just fun. Good things that we can do. Sustainable seafood. You guys, if you're not vegan, you like sushi. It's my, yeah. I need to give that up, but I can't. So I use Seafood Watch. It's a great little app, and it'll tell you what's, what's a better choice. So I don't want us to have to be extremists. I mean, if you want to be extreme, I'm going to applaud you. But the majority of us, in order to make a big change in the world, we all need to be able to make a difference. It's another way that we can do it. Spread the word. Let your friends know. Our oceans are essential not just for our recreation, but for our life. This is where our oxygen comes from. This is where a lot of our medicine comes from. It's essential for our atmosphere. It's essential for us. We need to protect it. It needs all the help it can get. Finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is what I originally said about um, marketing deception. There's no common, there's no standard, there's no agreed upon terminology for what, what is reef safe. People are taking out two ingredients and saying that it's reef safe. It doesn't exist. You have to be an educated consumer. Um, we've tested and proven. We've tested on freshwater fish, saltwater fish, sea elegans, and coral larvae. I hope more companies choose to do the same. But in the meantime, if you want to buy a product, ask. That's the consumers are driving the change today. Ask for change because our world deserves it. And I'd love to answer questions for anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm not speaking for myself, but a lot of people in my family use any lotion. Is there anything being done to like, help get rid of the toxins and tanning lotions? Sure. So the question was tanning lotions. Um, are they safe or are there, tox are there low toxin tanning lotions? Some of them are horrible. I mean, do not put that on your body and don't go lay in a tanning booth. Come on. Use a tanning lotion if you want to. If you want to be tan, great. There's um, DHA. You can buy it in the health food stores. Um, just There's safer alternatives, and DHA is one that's been proven to be okay. I don't know how it is in the environment. Don't put it all over your body and go jump in. But it seems to be a pretty good choice. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir? How quickly do the um, chemicals end up moving over time if we're not contributing something else? If people stopped wearing all these, uh, chemical dangerous sunscreens, how long would it take for the research to compensate? That's a fantastic question. So he just asked how long it's going to take for the reefs to get rid of these ingredients. Uh, if, if, am I understanding that right? So if we stop using oxybenzone, we stop using these harmful chemicals, how quickly will the world heal itself? How quickly will the ocean flush it out? Uh, well, it is bioaccumulating in the soil. So every time that the, especially in the populated beach areas, so it's on there, the waves are lapping it up, and it's going back out, which is one of the ways that we think that it's staying in the environment. Um, that said, we're really excited uh, to do some studies, um, the results of some studies that I know are going, that are happening in Hawaii. The ban doesn't take place until 2021. However, the consumer awareness, um, the, the concentrations of usage is falling drastically. I mean, the chemical lobbyists are going crazy trying to... Uh, stop all of this education and stop the progress of these bans because their sales are tanking, which is awesome. Um, it, it's going to take some time, but I believe that it will fill itself rapidly. The ocean wants to be healthy. Ma'am? Yeah. Um, anytime I go to a talk like this, um, my first reaction is to tell everybody that I know, right? Um, Thank you. We need all, that. <laughs> is all this information like, on your website? Um, can I find like, the studies? Can Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, and it's convincing them to be educated. Absolutely, um, we believe in full disclosure. All of our testing is on there. Our test methods are on there. Um, I've had people say, "Well, aren't other companies going to do this?" And I'm like, God, I hope so. I so hope so. Um, yeah, it's all on there. Our website. Did I say that there were prizes for great questions? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> oh, come, come on, come on. <laughs> Places that are, are banning all of these chemicals, do they have a way to actually follow through 
brewing. Now, you can abandon them in Hawaii, and people are usually bringing their own stuff from yeah. home. You know, I'm a big fan of education over legislation. Um, I would love to see the government change and say that these are prohibited. I think it, it, it's going to take a nationwide ban. The FDA, by the way, last week announced that only suns, only, ox, uh, I'm sorry, brain's going badly. Uh, only uh, zinc and titanium are generally recognized as safe. All the other approved ingredients are being required to submit new safety testing which is a fantastic step in the right direction. And I've forgotten the rest of that question. Oh, how are they, how are they going to regulate it? I don't know. I mean, how do you regulate? There's, um, there's some state parks in Mexico that say that you're not allowed to bring chemical sunscreens. They can only be, they say biodegradable and reef safe. It's a little bit loose, but it's, hey, it's the best in the world from what I've heard. When you show up at the parks, they actually check your bags. And if they see a bad sunscreen, they take it away from you. They'll give it back to you when you leave, from what I heard but they'll give you a good sample. They'll give you a sample of a good product to use. I think that's a great option. But how do you actually police it? I don't know. I mean, I know when I see somebody next to me that's about to go with the big old aerosol thing, I'm like, please don't. Please, please use this, right? <laughs> yeah, so the that's what it is. That's the goal. I've had so many people say, why do you put so much energy into the dive industry? I'm like, we have big mouths. We're educators. We're all trained to be educators. Why? This is a perfect market for change. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, I work in a pool, I see a lot of parents with their kids, you know, they spray on sunscreen and spray and they rub it off, and then maybe not even, yeah. they rub it in and then send their kid off. How do you go about, like, talking to someone, and it's like, like, I've used this, and it, it, it is a slower process, so how do you, like, convince someone to take away the convenience? Yeah, that's, that's the biggest challenge, because it does take a little bit more time. Um, again, the way that you can make a mineral sunscreen spread better is by adding oil. So with our formula, I reduced the amount of oil in there because aesthetically, number one, I didn't want to make it, I didn't want us to break out. Um, I have very sensitive skin, and oil causes a lot of us to break out. And I also uh, didn't want my mask to slip. So really, I made it selfishly for, for me. Um, but if I wanted to make one for kids, I would probably add three times the amount of oil because it would rub in a lot easier, and kids don't have that level of patience, and they don't really break out, right? Have a great night. Thank you for your questions. Um, so, so kids, kids' products are formulated a little bit differently. It's not that this is any less safe. A kid could totally use it if you can get them to hold still for it, right? But it's, it's safety. I mean, the best way I think that you could convince a kid is by telling the mom that she has to. I mean, look at the studies there. Developmental toxicity is huge. Avoid the endocrine disruptors for the kids. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you guys started with shampoos and have the sunscreen lotion. Do you have any plans to do like face washes and have the same right now? Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at bar soaps. Um, the, the chemicals, the, the surfactants used. Surfactants are um, like sodium lauryl and lauryl sulfate. Of course, we wouldn't use those. Those are used as the standard for aquatic toxicity in a lot of trials. Um, so I, I like organic bar soaps. I mean, some people say don't use a soap on your skin but or on, on your face, but if you use a gentle and a super fatted one, it's, it's wonderful. But yes, we are going to expand. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, another thing is uh, with the complexity of sunscreen and like going in and adding the hot oil, is it possible to maybe one day make an aerosol sunscreen the same? So when you get into aerosols, you're inhaling the ingredients. So titanium dioxide is safe. In the state of California, they require disclosures on a lot of products saying that it's uh, known to cause cancer. And what it is is it's an inhalation hazard, and it behaves like asbestos in your lungs. So when you have... Uh, Asbestos in the lungs, it's fine. I, I'm sorry, in your lungs. In, in the walls, in your lungs, it's bad. In the walls, it's okay, but when they start breaking it apart and it becomes an, an aerosol and you start inhaling it, it's a, it's a strong irritant. Same thing with these minerals. I don't, I don't think that you should be inhaling any of these chemicals. So it's convenient, but no, I don't, I don't think you should ever do an aerosol of a mineral sunscreen, or a regular one for that matter. I think those are bad news. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, don't don't use petroleum-based chemicals when you're playing in my ocean, please. Yeah, the body, you know, there's actually there's there's some people that are working on some things with like chita sand where it helps to absorb. Um, I get a little nervous when you're adding other ingredients to help absorb other ingredients. I mean, it's kind of like 
adding in Malaluca in Florida to clean up the Everglades, and now it's too dry. So I get a little nervous with some of those things, but they are working on ways to absorb up some of the chemicals that are in the waters. Really, I think the best thing is is educating and just reducing its usage, let it biodegrade, let it do its thing, and heal it the best we can afterwards. Yes, sir? I think you were talking about how the FDA standards are low in regards to uh, chemicals, as in, you put chemicals in the goldfish, uh, but they did disorient them and kind of essentially ruin their life. So are there any efforts in uh, either increasing their standards or at least showing them or educating, or at least passing some bills that they have to be in that approach? So the question was, um, how can we improve the FDA standards for toxicity? And it's actually the EPA standards. Maybe I misspoke, misspoke on that one, but it's the EPA test methods. And I don't know, that would require a lot of lobby dollars. That's, um, yeah, education. Exactly right. Yes, sir, I think you had a question, Michu? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was going to follow on the oils question. Um, so, and I'm not asking you to plug your competitors, but, uh, you know, there's products like Dr. Bronner's. Sure. Like they're supposedly all natural. Mm -hmm. it's organic oils. Are those salt is probably barring other, other ingredients that Right. So I have Dr. So the question was, um, can some of these other products, if you use natural vegetable base, can it solve the problems um, of what we're using it in the waters? I have Dr. Bronner's in my home. Um, I've been using them for a good long time. I think they're great. It's It surprised me when I did aquatic toxicity testing and my product, my initial formulas failed. So I really do believe that there needs to be a test method, a test standard, uh, to determine what actually is reef safe. And that's going to require non- um, manufacturers, I think, to be leading that charge. Because I can say what I believe is reef safe, but convincing the rest of the world to follow that, it shouldn't be my standard. It should be either industry standards, which I think we are discussing that we've, uh, we're a member of a group called the Safe Sunscreen Council, which has 12 member companies. Right now it's, um, it was inspired by Dr. Craig Downs of Hereticus Environmental Labs. And uh, we're working on some, some different topics and standards out there, and there's some disagreement, but it's also, it's, it's the start, it's a very, um, young industry, and it's wonderful that we're collaborating, working together on it. Yes, ma'am. So, what kind of toxicity testing do you do that the EPA doesn't do? Um, like specifically talking about how you like protect marine and ocean life. So, what specifically do you do that you think happens on that? So, her question was, what testing do we do that the EPA hasn't standardized? So, biodegradability, for example, um, bio it was really difficult to find a lab that would test our biodegradability, which all of our products, I wanted to know, are they, there's readily biodegradable and ultimately biodegradable. And I had to go to, I think it was the sixth lab that I went to that agreed to do a biodegradability study without adding sewage sludge to it. So the typical EPA test method, they're concerned with how products are going to degrade when they go into the sewers, right, the sewers and the septic systems and such. And I don't care how, it, I mean, I, of course I care, but what I really want to know is if we go to, if we go hiking and we use my shampoo in the river, how quickly is it going to biodegrade? Or in the ocean, how quickly is my sunscreen going to biodegrade? And that was actually really hard to find a lab that would do it without adding activated sewage sludge. Um, so that's, that's one example. I think it's just creativity and it's thinking about it. It's creating the standards, the universities. Uh, when I partnered with Eckerd College, I wasn't as concerned about toxicity. The EPA has that toxicity test that that other company uses that says that it's bait safe. I really don't care how many are going to die. I want to know how healthy are they, right? So I had to work with a university to create new standards for us. And what's the appropriate level of addition? You know, how much do you, what's the concentration? We had to extrapolate. Okay, if you're taking a shower in a bathtub and then a fish happens to jump in the bathtub, you know, what, what are the right levels to test? And it's, um, I think it's really students and universities that are going to create that for us. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir? You. You. Uh, so I know for like so you were talking about talking about toxic compounds are uh, very harmful. Um, and I know like the RMS configurations are cattle sensors oftentimes. One of them is more of the active one and the other one doesn't mm -hmm. do right. drugs, what the drug actually does. You're a so, chemist, aren't you? Uh, You're trying to get me. Yeah. <laughs> so if you know is both of them just as harmful, uh, the configurations are they were able to change the nitrate configuration to be like that S configuration that's inactive to kind of 
So he's asking the chiral state, which, um, which oxybenzone, which state is toxic, and I honestly don't know the answer to that one. We could reach out to Dr. Craig Downs, who did some of the studies on there, and he could probably tell us, but I would imagine that it's whichever one occurs um, in the lab. None of it occurs in nature, so it's not really like we can say one state is natural and one isn't. It's just whatever is stable is the one that they tested. Boy, it's hard to see it there. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I don't mean to sound stingy about this, but for like college students who have no money, especially those who burn really easily, like me, right. and I have to constantly be replying, probably sure. to, like half the bottle and then the day of the beach. Uh, what's kind of like the price difference between the safe sunscreen and the kind that you can easily get in bulk <coughs> at stores that have all harmful chemicals? And what can you kind of do to buy it easier? And sure. That's a great question. So we're asking about the economics of using a safe or a natural product. You know, like if you buy organic produce, a lot of times it's three times higher, right? And some skincare products are three times higher as well. When we priced our products and we looked at the marketplace, you know, you've got La Roche, you've got, you've got everything on sunscreen for this size product that would retail for $4.99 to $34.99. I mean, the, the range is huge. And what's the difference? I mean, Again, I'm a cosmetic chemist. There's some ingredients that are better and more expensive than others. But I really couldn't justify how could this company be charging $35 or $60 even for this product that the ingredients really weren't that much more expensive. Um, but what, what can you do? Well, a mineral sunscreen, first off, one like ours, it's very, very concentrated. Um, the FDA regulates what you say on the back of the bottle. Um, application instructions, it says apply liberally. God, I'd really rather you not apply it liberally because you're going to look stupid and you're never going to want to use my product again. <laughs> So it's, yes, apply it all over and reapply often, you know, or apply it to exposed skin and reapply, but you don't want to do a large percentage. You don't want to do a big old glob. You will not go through a third of a tube or half a tube in a weekend at the beach. Um, it's much more concentrated. Healthy ingredients usually go further, and I would say play with it. I mean, it's, it's an investment in your health. Yes, your, your initial cost is going to be higher. Um, hopefully you'll use less and you'll be healthier for it. Yes, sir? What's the best way of disposing of toxic products? Oh, that's a good question. That's a scary one. In Hawaii, they're incinerating them. Um, I, I recommend hazardous material disposal days. Most communities have like a hazmat day. And literally, we did a swap out. We, we went to a lot of our dive centers three years ago and said, if you have sunscreen with oxybenzone or parabens in them, that we'll give you a dollar for dollar trade out because I wanted them off the shelves. Well, then I sat there with like barrels of the stuff. I'm like, oh my God, what do you do with it, right? It's, it's a tough one. I mean, what's the right method? I took it to the hazmat center. And what they did with it from there, I probably should know, but I didn't want to know. The best thing is to reduce the consumption of it, I, I believe. Just phase it out. Yes, ma'am. So just back to your testing, uh, you know, fish oils, I'm interested in uh, using uh, just saltwater fish in well, We did freshwater fish and saltwater fish. Um, we started with sea elegance. Um, which I didn't know what they were until the Go Toxicology Lab told me that we should start with C. elegans because I won't kill as many fish if we do it that way. And as soon as she said, because we won't kill as many fish, I'm like, yes, I'm in. So that's what we started with. But yeah, both of them. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the oceans and places that already are contaminated with very high parts per trillion and yeah. million uh, chemicals, how can we protect ourselves if we want to swim in them now? Ooh, okay. So Dr. Craig Downs has said that he will not allow his children to swim in public swimming pools because he went out and he was sampling the pools and said the concentrations were just appalling and he believes it will actually soak into your body. And yeah, he, so he won't, he won't let that happen. In the... Oceans, I don't think there's enough, like in, in Hanama Bay where it's the highest concentration. I don't know. I mean, if you can see the oil stick on the surface, don't do it. Just don't do it. But as long as you've got tidal flow going, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not a fear monger. I wouldn't live in fear. I would just don't put it on your body and try to avoid it. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about, you said how they can't, you know, there's not a lot of people that don't have this in their body because it's so common. So. Does it ever leave the body? So like if you were yes. to stop using it now and you have a baby in five years, yes. does it transmit or it just kind of cycles out? Yes, they've done tests. Um, there was one that was published in Switzerland, I believe, a couple years back that showed that they removed these. They had a, a household of, of you know, it was a, a family with three kids, and they had dangerously high levels of contaminants in their bodies. They took everything out of their world, and one year later, 
it was basically non-detect for all of them. So yeah, it, it does come out. I mean, it hangs out a disgustingly long time, but just it, it, your body wants to be healthy. Yes, sir. Along the lines of that question, um, how long does it take to get out of the portal, especially after they have the leashing mask? Right. Because I'm imagining they will reuptake those uh, symbiotic algae until they've gotten rid of these compounds. Right, right. So the question is um, how quickly will the coral heal itself? Um, that's kind of the million dollar question. We're hoping that it'll be fast. And there's some been, been some really good news on that front. Hawaii, uh, which was disgusting in the state of decline, they're saying that it's looking up. They're getting areas of regrowth in areas that they haven't had growth for years. They're seeing, you know, the edges are, are healing. Um, I, I, I think we'll see positive change quickly. But it's, it's everything, right? I mean, sewer, sewer systems and the keys um, all the way through. It's, Yes, ma'am. Um, on that, <laughs> how long is it going to you to get back to the end of my, you know, that, um, you know, that person's Good night, guys. Thanks for coming. How much damage to the to the reef do we think came from human activity versus, like, climate change and ocean acidification? Or, I would say, like, more so these products versus, like, yeah. It's it's a it's a hard question. I don't know. I think that again, anything that we can do to help to give our reefs a fighting chance, we should do. Um, there's scientists out there that are saying that this argument is um, diluting the message and it's changing the focus. They don't like it. They say just let people use their sunscreen because we need to be talking about climate change. And I say yes, let's talk about climate change and let's stop people from using toxic sunscreen. Right? How much comes from one? I don't know. Who knows? Um, but if once you're educated, why would you use any better, any any different? You know, for you or the reefs, right? Looking up, any other? Yes, sir. Are all the ingredients of sunscreen disclosed? They're supposed to be. In your experience, are they? Mostly. Um, small companies, new companies that I would like to say don't know any better. It's not widely, it, it is regulated, but it's not widely policed. Um, sunscreens are regulated as drugs. If you see an active ingredient, if you see a drug facts panel on the back, chances are they're full disclosure. Um, if you don't see that, like a lot of the homemade zinc sunscreens and such, they're not regulated, and I personally believe they're dangerous. Um, sunscreen's not something to mess around with. I'm all for kitchen chemistry. I'm all for making your own soap at home, making bath bombs, making body lotions, body oils. Do it. It's fun. I am not for making your own sunscreen. I mean, the amount of testing and regulation that goes into it and the challenges, I mean, the, the spreadability, if you wind up, if you get too much in the bottom and not enough on the top, if it doesn't cool at the proper rate, you know, it's not going to have the even dispersion. That's dangerous. You're going to go out and burn yourself. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you said earlier that there was 85.6% of these are born with the oxyphenone in their system. Do you know if the concentration is enough, like, to begin having, like, the endocrine or effect? Like, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the study's up there. If you if you Google it, it'll come right to the top. You know, babies with endocrine disruption, and it's on PubMed. You can you can get it readily. Um, what that actually translates to in the hormone disruption and the cycle, ask an endocrinologist. I personally think that it's horrifying and scary. But what the actual end result is, I don't know. Just to go along with that too, like whenever you have like a small child, they end up getting lather off the sunscreen. Like exactly right. Right. So, that definitely so what the FDA is talking about today is that. Um, what, 20, 25 years ago, people weren't using as much sunscreen as they are today, which is why they're wanting to reevaluate the safety standards, which is wonderful. They're right. I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, how much sunscreen women laid out there with the little aluminum foil plates and tried to bake in the sun, you don't really see that so much anymore. But we are using way more than we ever did before. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. But I know that there are some people like I love her, by the way. There's there's a young lady there that I absolutely adore. He says, uh, "What about people that are making their own sunscreen?" Um, I spent a lot of time with her. Well, not a, not enough time with her when I was in Palau. I she's one of the. I think she's the president of Oceans Free. Say it again. Airs for oceans. That's it. So how do you make your own? Um, I I wouldn't do it. 
I wouldn't do it. She's she's put a lot more thought and effort into it than other people. It's not FDA regulated over there. All right. Good night. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned uh, back on the thing about the oxygen in our bodies. Um, I know you mentioned that it can be found in shormer and their eggs and sea turtles. Right. Uh, how often is it to be found in animals that may not? So, how likely is the is the sunscreen chemicals to be in other mammals that aren't sea creatures? I don't think it's very likely. Um, there's other chemicals that they're finding, like in um, that are in the inland rivers and such. You know, they're finding uh, uh, antibiotics, um, hormone uh, hormone what, like pills, um, birth control pills. They're finding things like that in the inland creatures. But I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of sunscreens. It's just not there. Right, right. Now, those birds in that area, or those deer in that particular area, I don't think it's been studied, but I wouldn't be surprised if you would find some around there. It's more about um, what's nesting, right? That's where it seems to be holding, hanging on, not necessarily drinking in the water because that biodegrades relatively quickly, but like in the sand and where they're nesting, it's, it's holding it in, the silica is absorbing it. Any other questions hanging out there? Yes, sir. But I'm wondering, uh, you're saying these chemicals have, that where corals weren't able to adhere to the substrate and start drawing. Right. And I'm wondering if, if the chemicals in these products are similar to chemicals used in anti-fouling paints that they use in voting. Right, like the zincs that are that are in the bottoms. Yeah. So I just wanted to was wondering if that was, if it was a similar like, chemical process or if it was just a physical process. You know, I, I'm not sure on that one. I haven't studied the, vein, the the coatings, but I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of those ingredients, especially if they have phthalates in them, um, like the BPAs and plastics have very similar effects. If they're endocrine disrupting chemicals, I would imagine they would affect the DNA of the coral in a very similar way. Any other questions around there? Thank you guys. This is fantastic. Um, yes, ma'am. It's more just like a general skincare kind of question, but sure. I often hear some people saying like you should wear SPF on your face every day, and other people are saying that that's harmful. Yeah. What is the right thing to do? So should you wear sunscreen every single day? That's a that's a good debate. That's a good question. I think that if you're using a healthy sunscreen, um, I think it's great. We've seen we published an image recently on a truck driver that he didn't wear sunscreen. But you could clearly see, like, this half of his face, he's driving, right? This half of his face was, I mean, like, melted. I mean, it literally looked like he was 90 years old. This half, he looked like a 45-year-old man. I mean, it's just freaky. So do I think that it adds up? Yeah. I also believe that a little bit of sun's not going to hurt you. You know, we need our vitamin D. We need our production. I don't think, again, I'm not an extremist. I think that you should have a little bit out there. But if you're hanging out, you're going for walks, you're going playing tennis, yeah, wear your sunscreen. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, the lights is kind of hard to see. Um, so it says everywhere it's like the plastic with the packaged materials. Yes. So um, <laughs> how, how would you like recommend that we dispose of the actual packaging? Yeah, so the packaging that we use, um, I wish that we could have a completely plastic free product. Um, we struggled with that. Um, how do you create a healthy product and then put it in an unhealthy package, right? I hate single use plastics. I bought these dry bags. I love these things. And the little handles came wrapped in a little plastic thing. And I said, I will never order from you again if you send them in this little plastic bag again. Um, but the, the tubes that we use, we use uh, sugarcane resins. We import them from Israel because they had a global worldwide patent when we did this. Um, it's a really unique technology. They're using the bagasse, the waste of the sugarcane processing. It actually helps to power and fuel their plant too. So it's considered a carbon neutral process. But the tube itself is actually considered a plastic. It's bioplastic. So in all intents and purposes, it is plastic. You have to recycle it. It is not biodegradable. You have to recycle it. And just toss it in the recycling bin. Any other questions there? Yes, sir. Because I like to sleep at night. Um, I, it, it wasn't my first, thank you. It wasn't, um, I didn't start it because I needed a job. I didn't start it because... Um, I don't know, I was looking to make a gazillion dollars on it. I started it because I love our oceans and I knew that we could do better. So why aren't other companies doing it? I think there's companies that are trying to. 
the animal testing that is hard. Um, I was one of the original signers of the campaign for safe cosmetics back in, I think it was in 2002 when we were developing that. It was in the Natural Products Association and we're, we're developing the standards. You don't need to test mascara on bunnies to see if it's going to burn their eyes. There's culture tests that you can do. You can do cells in a lab and you can tell if it's going to be inflammatory. You can tell if it's going to hurt the eyes um, or the skin. There's dermal patches. There's no need to torture animals to do these things. There's no studies like that for fish. There's no studies like that for coral. Um, we have ecotoxicologists and marine biologists. I know we have a group here. Those would be wonderful studies to develop. I would love to see some people work on those, especially as this is becoming more trendy. When I started formulating this line five years ago, the raw material suppliers, very rarely do they have any aquatic toxicity on their raw materials. So I'm looking at the surfactants. What's the toxicity? Well, not expected to be toxic. Well, I failed, right? Now, five years later, because it's trendy, more and more of the raw material suppliers are doing the aquatic toxicity. What does that mean? I mean, they're, they're testing on fish. And as much as I don't like the idea of testing on fish, I like the idea of selling a product that is harmful to the fish and believing that it's safe even less. So, smart friends, please work on that for me. Yes, sir. Do I ever get the feeling that it's my company against the world? Sometimes it feels like an uphill battle, but one of the amazing things that I like to say is um, I don't have customers out there, we have advocates. And every time that I have somebody out there that tries to slam me for something, I have beautiful friends like you that put them in their place before I've even seen it. So it's, no, I don't feel like it's me against the world. I think that it's me and some of my friends helping to educate the world. And hopefully you'll be one of those friends. Yes? Um, I was wondering, does your company offer any internship or research opportunities? <laughs> uh, so do we have any internship or research opportunities? Yeah, call me. It's, uh, I live in a really rural town in Wachula, Florida, Central Florida, and we don't have a whole lot of dough, but we've got a lot of great ideas and we need a lot of help. So especially um, marketing, science communication, science communication, how do you tell this stuff to the world? How do you talk about it? We definitely need help with that. Um, video, communications, technology, definitely. Great question, thank you. I would toss you something and I will before we're done. But my arm's not so good. Any other questions out there? This was wonderful, friends. Thank you all so very much. One more. Yes, ma'am. It's okay. I'm just wondering, like, hard makeup. Yeah, makeup. Okay. Sure. Are there any brands that you recommend or that you know are actually doing this kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it just like. Yeah, so makeup companies that are doing good in the world. Um, I like uh, Honeybee Gardens. It's a beautiful, sweet little company. Um, you can buy them online. I think they're in Whole Foods. Um, Larinum is a mineral makeup brand also, and they're not overly expensive. And again, going back to the economic side of it, the mineral suns, the mineral makeups, and a lot of these products, they're a little more expensive than Maybelline and some of those. But usually you'll find, again, you don't need to use quite as much, and it'll hold longer. Um, so yeah, there's some really good sweet brands out there doing good in the world. Um, look at your local health food store. That's a good place to start. All right. So there were some beautiful pictures that were up here earlier. Did you guys see the slideshow when he came in? I had some questions about sharks. You guys mind if I put it back on? If anybody needs to leave, I understand. We've been talking a long time, but I'm going to put the sharks back up. And if anybody has questions about those images, John, who is my partner over here, I get to bring my photographer with me every time we go underwater. Pretty awesome. And he'd be delighted to answer any questions about underwater photography, um, the health of the reefs around the world, as well as sharks, diving with sharks and taking pictures of large animals. So I'm going to pull that back up. And thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. It was fun.